Hi everyone and welcome back. Today I'll be making a compound called tosylic acid or para-toluene sulfonic acid using toluene and sulfuric acid. So this is basically what the reaction looks like. This proceeds through a process called sulfonation whereupon uh, we have an arene here and an arene is something that has a, an unsaturated aromatic species in it so like uh, naphthalene is an arene, benzene is an arene, to uh, toluene, xylene, things like that. Uh, anyway, so toluene is an arene and it undergo a sulfonation reaction when exposed to very concentrated sulfuric acid, heat, and uh, sometimes sulfur trioxide is needed because this type of reaction is actually particularly difficult to force. And some things can barely be sulfonated at all. The yields are either very low, or the process takes a lot of time, or the temperature is so high that the products start to decompose as you're forming them. So it's a difficult reaction, but they make a lot of important products. And I'll be making this paratoluene sulfonic acid for use as an acid catalyst in some upcoming reactions. Now this reaction involves an equilibrium between the, the two sides, and in order to drive the reaction and help it uh, and help increase our yield, I'll be removing the water from one side continuously. And this is very conveniently done because toluene happens to be one of our reactants. And if you look back on a previous video I did on a Dean Stark trap for drying, I think it was oxalic acid, you can see that a Dean Stark trap is a specific piece of apparatus that allows you to set up a continuous loop of refluxing toluene, which removes water continuously from a reaction. And so, since toluene happens to be one of these reactants, uh, that could very easily be set up in this case, and it's convenient to drive this particular reaction to completion, or as far to completion as we can. Now, before I get started, I'm going to have to perform a purification step mm -hmm. on the toluene. And that's because commercial toluene, like I have, is distilled from petroleum products and often contains sulfur byproducts. And those byproducts are usually removed in distillation, however, several will remain with the toluene because they have very, or boiling points very close to that of toluene. And the one that's of particular interest today is actually a compound called methyl thiophene. So thiophene is a five-membered ring that looks like this. It's a heterocyclic ring, the sulfur in it, and uh, there's a methyl group either here or over here. And uh, this methyl thiophene has a very close boiling point to toluene, and it'll start to polymerize and discolor our sulfonic acid when we, uh, when we go to make it. Um, when it reflux it in the sulfuric acid with the Dean Stark trap and all that. So, the solution to that is actually this exact reaction. What I'll do is I'll add cold sulfuric acid to the mixture of toluene, which has a little bit of methyl thiophene in it, and it turns out that uh, because of this sulfur in the ring and also the methyl group, this ring is actually much more strongly activated and can form a sulfonic acid, so SO3. It'll form a sulfonic acid group a lot more readily than the toluene will. So by stirring this simply with just a little bit of warm sulfuric acid, I can basically form this compound out of the methyl thiophene and then go ahead and treat that solution with a base wash and this uh, sulfonic acid now being much more soluble in water than the original compound will simply go into the aqueous layer and can be washed away. And so I'm going to do a pretreatment of the toluene first so that this product isn't discolored and then I can go ahead and, and do this. So. Let's go to the bench and set that up. So I have here about 150 milliliters of commercial toluene, and we're first going to treat it with the cold sulfuric acid. So I've got a stir bar in there, and I'm just going to get this slowly stirring. And I've got the sulfuric acid that I made in a previous video. It's just simply distilled sulfuric acid, so it's about 95%. And I'm going to measure out uh, roughly 15 milliliters. So you want about 10% sulfuric acid to toluene when you're doing the thiophene removal. We don't want this to boil or anything, we're just trying to get it to uh, destroy the thiophenes and react with them to form the sulfonic acids. And you can see that something's happening, it's gotten a little cloudy. You can see after stirring for a few minutes that the sulfuric acid layer has gone sort of a dingy yellow color. And that is because of the absorption of sulfur compounds, particularly the methyl thiophene, sulfur, or methyl thiophene sulfonic acid. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, and that's also why the Sulfuric acid is sort of clouding this layer of toluene here. It's because of the suspended sulfonic acids as well as micro droplets of, uh, of sulfuric acid. And as a comparison, you can see that the sulfuric acid started as a completely transparent, water clear liquid, completely colorless. Anyway, we'll let this stir for about 10 minutes in the cold to make sure that all the sulfur compounds are officially reacted. And when that happens, we can then decant the toluene from the sulfuric acid and then wash it with a weak bicarbonate solution or a carbonate solution. Any weak base will work. And that will further pull all of the sulfonic acids formed out of this solution. And then we can go ahead and use the toluene uh, and sulfonate it as we intend to to make the paratoluene sulfonic acid. While that stirs, I'm going to make a weak sodium carbonate solution. So I have here approximately 200 milliliters of water, and I'm just going to add a little bit of commercial grade sodium carbonate to it. Now this is just pool uh, pH plus for raising the pH of a pool. 
and it's just some, it's basically just a white powder. We don't want this saturated, just basically enough to remove any residual acid and to uh, ensure that the resulting mixture stays basic and we remove all the sulfuric acid and everything out of the toluene. So this will take a second to dissolve and uh, it should be completely dissolved in about the 10 minutes left that that uh, toluene has left to stir. And so we'll come back and do the wash. Alright, so the, the toluene and the sulfuric acid mixture have been stirring for approximately 10 minutes and I'm going to turn the stirring off now and let that settle, but I don't think I really need much time. As you can see, it's layered out wonderfully there. I'm just going to decant the toluene into this clean beaker here and then uh, discard the sulfuric acid and then pour the carbonate solution in this beaker, stir that with the toluene until I get a basic reading, and then we'll know that the toluene has been successfully washed free of sulfur compounds as well as uh, any excess sulfuric acid. So I'm going to go ahead and pour this off here, being careful not to get any of the sulfuric acid layer on the bottom. That's okay if I waste some because I started with a lot of excess. There we go. So we're ending up with about 150 milliliters of cloudy toluene. Here's the sulfuric acid. As you can see, it's very well yellowed and quite contaminated. I'm going to go ahead and dispose of this very safely, neutralize it, pour it down the drain, and then uh, we can go ahead and wash this with the sodium carbonate solution. All right, I've got this beaker cleaned and uh, rinsed out. It's okay that it's still a little wet. I'll transfer the toluene back into this beaker and start the stirring rather vigorously. Then we can go ahead and add small portions of the carbonate solution we made before. Now there's still a couple of chunks in the bottom there. Obviously you don't want to heat this up to dissolve this unless you're going to plan on cooling it down again simply because obviously if we add the hot carbonate solution to the toluene it's going to vaporize the toluene a lot into the room and that's going to make everybody loopy. You don't want that to happen. So I'm going to add this very slowly and neutralize the acid and collect all of those sulfonic acids from this toluene. That should theoretically be sufficient. I can use some pH paper really quick to test to see that I have completely neutralized the, uh, the acid in there. So pH paper comes in these little books. It's really cheap. You can get them for like 60 cents for a pack of five. Just gonna dip it really quick and you can see, yes, it is in fact basic. So we have neutralized all the acid. We are now pulling the sulfonic acids into the water layer, and pretty soon we'll have some nice clean toluene. All right, this has been stirring for about five minutes. I'm gonna turn the stirring off and let uh, everything settle out. And while that's occurring, I'm gonna set it aside and then set up the apparatus for the Dean Stark trap and everything that we'll need to make the sulfonic acid. I have the apparatus all set up. I've got a 500 milliliter round bottom flask in this heating mantle here, and that's connected to the Dean Stark trap, which is then connected to a condenser. And so what happens is the toluene in water will boil as an azeotrope in this flask, and that, that water vapor and toluene vapor, which will be mostly toluene vapor, somewhere in the 90%, I can't really remember exactly what it is, but it's mostly toluene. It will travel up this side arm here and uh, to the condenser, where it will condense and drip straight down into this trap. It will be stopped by the stopcock and start filling up this side arm. Now when the side arm gets too full, it'll start spilling over back down the arm and back into the still pot there. And so in that way a cycle of toluene is established and uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, or I guess in an earlier video, any water that uh, form that drops into this trap too, which comes with the toluene as the vapor, is not soluble in the toluene and so it'll start collecting, being heavier than the toluene, down here in the trap. And I can periodically use the stopcock here to take the water off. So this affords basically a continuous loop of refluxing toluene that allows me to remove water on a continuous basis and, uh, as mentioned earlier, will drive that reaction. So I have the, uh, the reactants down here. We have sulfuric acid. I'm using about a 10 to 1 ratio by volume, which is good enough. We have a much larger excess of toluene than we need for sulfuric acid. We just want to make sure that all the acid is used, and in generally about 10% ratio is good. So I've got a roughly 130 milliliters of this uh, rough toluene here. It's still a little cloudy from the water, but uh, I stirred it with the bicarbonate solution for about 20 minutes and then decanted it. And that's what you see here. Uh, I've got a stir bar, which is also going to go in the flask, and about 13 milliliters of sulfuric acid. And to charge the flask, I've got this handy 2440 funnel here, and I'm going to go ahead and add all of these components. Stir bar in carefully. The toluene. And the sulfuric acid very carefully. Now I'm going to remove this funnel 
and hook this up to the apparatus. And then raise the heating mantle and begin heating. There we go, nice and tight. The Dean Stark stopcock is closed, very important, remember that. And uh, yes, we will start heating and start stirring as well. I'll now turn on the condenser water. And that's about a good flow rate. And this is all set up and ready to go. Alright, you can see the toluene is starting to boil and we are collecting toluene in the Dean Stark trap and actually it looks like we've got a water layer starting to come out too, which is good. That means that the reaction is progressing or at least we're removing the water from the sulfuric acid or something. Now sulfuric acid is taking on a slightly yellow color. Um, I think that's because of some impurities and the sodium salts thereof, which I don't think will pre present a significant impurity in the final product due to the nature of how it's going to be isolated. So uh, we'll get to that step when we get there, but anyway, this just needs to reflux for approximately four hours and uh, after that, we can come check up on it and see how much water we've collected. And uh, when water stops collecting, essentially, that's when we know it's done. And at that point, we can isolate the paratoluene sulfonic acid. All right, I've been refluxing for about 45 minutes now, and you can see that some water has indeed collected in the bottom of the Dean Stark trap, which means that we are progressing quite well. Um, it's still a biphasic layer down there, which means that there's still an aqueous layer, meaning, of course, we haven't trapped all the water in the Dean Stark trap, and that there's still a ways to go on the reaction. If I can get the camera to fo focus uh, up close, you can see that every time some drops land in the Dean Stark trap from the condenser, that a small bead of water or two will drift the uh, sorry drift their way down to the bottom. You can see them right there. I took my thumb. Kind of gets cloudy. Oh, there's a big glob, and uh, that's the water that's collecting in the Dean Stark trap that we are removing from this side of the equation, thus driving it this way to form our product. So anyway, we'll. Uh, check back up on this in a few more hours when this has gone to completion. Alright, I've been refluxing for about four hours now and I don't think any more water is coming over so you can see we've collected quite a bit there. The mixture in the boiling flask has become uh, monophasic as opposed to biphasic or using a more aqueous layer so we've removed pretty much all the water that we can from this and it's essentially ready to go. So what I'll do is I'll turn the heating off and let this cool down. Now in there is anhydrous paratoluene sulfonic acid, and it's dissolved in toluene. The best way to get that out is actually to add a little bit of water back to the flask, and what will happen is the monohydrate of the paratoluene sulfonic acid will precipitate from the toluene, whereupon it can be vacuum filtered. So I'm going to go about doing that very shortly. All right, so I have the flask here of the paratoluene sulfonic acid in toluene, and it's still pretty hot, so it will stink a lot. It will volatilize in the room, and obviously it's kind of a formability hazard at the moment. Realistically, you should wait till it cools down, but what I'm going to do is uh, add the water while it's hot, because that will help larger crystals form of the monohydrate of the paratoluene sulfonic acid, which will uh, exclude more impurities and develop a little purer product, hopefully. So I'll just add this to the speaker, and then I'm going to add 9 milliliters of distilled water and kind of swirl it around a little bit, and uh, should see some crystals form, and then as it cools down, even more will form, and then I'll go ahead and vacuum filter it. So the first thing to do is to transfer it, and it's still kind of hot, so I'm going to use the tongs. And then the 9 milliliters of water. And you can already see crystallization beginning to take place. I'll just stir that and uh, let that cool and in about 10 or 15 minutes when that's cold we should have some nice large crystals of toluene sulfonic acid. In fact you can see it all over the walls here already. Alright, it's been a few minutes and I've been scraping the, uh, the residue here down off the walls with this rubber scraper and you can see that we're left with a perfectly clear layer of toluene here with uh, some nice easily filterable crystals right on top. And so I'm going to go ahead and run this through a vacuum filtration and you can see I've set up for that already here. This is just a little uh, Buchner funnel with a frit in it and you know, vacuum takeoff 500 milliliter flask. Start the vacuum, pardon the sound of the aspirator and the fan going at the same time. I know that's probably loud and annoying, but it's the best I can do at the moment. 
And I'm going to go ahead and very carefully scoop. I guess I can just pour this through first. Okay, I think that's about all we're going to get out of the beaker. I'll just pack this down a little bit while the aspirator does its magic and uh, pulls the rest of the toluene out of this. Okay, so the crude product's been sitting on the aspirator for a little while, so I'll go ahead and break the vacuum here. Shut that off. Then I'll take this out and put it on a glass pan where we can put it on the double boiler situation and dry it out. And I'm actually going to take the remnants of this flask down here and throw it back in the beaker and add a little more water and see if we can recover a second crop of crystals, just to make sure that the hydrolysis here has completed. Alright, I have the crude product here on the water bath now, and that'll gently heat it and drive off any remaining toluene and a lot of the water, and then it can be crushed up into a powder, and that's basically it. That just goes into a container, and then we'll have some uh, paratoluene sulfonic acid for some upcoming reactions. By the way, I did add some more water to the toluene that we got from the vacuum filtration, and it turns out there really was not an appreciable amount of uh, acid left in there, and it mostly just formed a cloudy aqueous layer in the toluene. I left the paratoluene sulfonic acid on the water bath until it melted. And you can see here it's this uh, runny mess and it's rapidly solidifying. And when this finally solidifies, uh, it will be free of toluene, which is the main goal of this exercise here, uh, which means that in a vacuum desiccator, it's not going to, or it'll dehydrate a whole lot faster because it's not competing for the vapor pressure of toluene uh, in the desiccator itself. This will also solidify into a nice hard mass which we may not even need to vacuum desiccate at all. We're going to take a look at this in a couple of minutes and see what that's all about. Alright, so after a few minutes of continuously uh, pushing this around, you can see that uh, the product here is pretty much completely dry. Now, unlike a lot of what procedures call for uh, through various books and things like that, a vacuum desiccator is not strictly needed for this. And you can see this is pretty much almost completely dry already. And maybe if you needed it analytically dry or something like that, a vacuum desiccator would help you. But if you simply melt it and you just stir it around a whole bunch, um, it will eventually dry on its own at, uh, at room temperature. And that's, in my experience, what I've found. Anyway, this is just going to go into this container now. And here's the final product. It is a lumpy crystalline white powder here, maybe slightly off-white because of some impurities, but uh, this could also be recrystallized, but I'm not going to do that because I, the impurities that are in this aren't really going to affect anything I'm going to use it for. So if I need pure stuff, then I will recrystallize it uh, when I, as needed, basically, but uh, this is good enough for now. This is the structure of the paratoluene sulfonic acid, also known as tosilic acid in the industry. So if you ever see something that says uh, tosilic acid, I'm going to spell that out. It's T-O-S-Y-L-I-C acid, right? Or uh, sometimes you'll see it abbreviated as T-S-O-H or P-T-S-O-H. Same thing. Um, they're all referring to paratoluene and sulfonic acid. Anyway, if you liked watching this video as much as I liked making it, please press the like button. If you want to see more videos like this, please press the subscribe button. Um, I do have a Patreon account, so if you'd like to donate a dollar or something like that to help me continue making these videos, I'll put a link in the description. I'm also on Twitter and Google+. I'll put those links in the description as well if you'd like to follow uh, what I'm doing or ask a question or something like that, and I'll try and answer as many as possible. And thank you very much for watching.